Hi, everyone. I'm so excited for this historic episode of Tigress, the podcast, where I have my first guest ever. Um, we are in studio in Times Square, and guess who's joining me? Amea! Amea Okamoto, my fabulous sister, um, who is currently in art school in Chicago, um, her first year there, and yeah, she's visiting me for the next couple weeks. Um, Amea, welcome to Tigris. Thank you. How are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling good. Uh, just got off a plane, a little unexpected, but glad to be a part of this historic moment for Tigris. And are you feeling nervous? A little bit. Why? You're like the most unfiltered. I am the most extroverted Okamoto. You are. Fun I fact. claim that. I fully claim that. Uh, no, it's been a while since I've been doing interviews and stuff. I mean, it's even kind of weird that I can say that. But yeah, I feel like I haven't been in front of a camera in a while. And do I make you nervous? Yeah, really. I mean, my whole life, my, I mean, we could talk about so much more, but my whole life has been so much being, you know, Nadia's sister or being the younger sister, because I'm only two years younger than you. Mm -hmm. So, so much of our lives, I feel like we've definitely had a lot of comparison, whether that's in the world, in school, in families or whatever. So it's been a huge the past five years to really like come into my own and like start having my own like... I really don't want to use the word branding. No, you can say brand. <laughs> but like kind of having Everybody's a personal yeah, brand, like, you know? That's so Gen Z disgusting. Yeah, like having my own brand or um, a lot of big moments. Like I remember when we went to LA in 2019. Maybe. I did this workshop and like in LA and we were both flown out for like a separate, like for this one event. And I didn't realize that we were both invited for the longest time. And then you were like, oh, I'm going to LA this weekend. And I was like, oh, me too. And we got there. Nobody knew we were sisters for the longest time. And that was like super weird at 19 years old for the first time to be like, holy shit. Like that's a Maya's sister. Like you're not in my shadow. Yeah. Or I'm not in your domain, you know, like, yeah. or realizing I can have my own domain in the world um, was really weird. Cause I think we grew up our whole lives being so they're just like compared. entwined and not even compared just like so entwined with each other's lives very trauma like, bonded is yeah. that what it is <laughs> yeah that's definitely what it is i mean i feel like i mean you know we've kind of alluded to this on social media um when people ask us like oh you guys seem like your best friends which we are but it's also kind of new in many ways I'm your best friend. yeah okay okay i'm not her best friend <laughs> no, I'm kidding, she's I'm kidding. my best friend I'm kidding. but you know i think people look at our family and they're like you're so happy. It's so There's wonderful. There's a lot of like goals. Y'all are my yeah. favorite sisters. Can I, when people are like, can I be the fourth sister? I'm like, I don't know if you want to be. You got to earn that. <laughs> and that is, that is a yeah. lot of shit you have to go through to earn that. But I feel like, there's also this kind of dark side of our history, which yeah. is that a man and I didn't talk for years, really. No. And um, I think that there was a lot of resentment and a lot of, you know, our childhood trauma and history of being yeah compared to each other and I mean I think whenever people hear that they're like oh my gosh that's so sad but I do feel like to what you were saying before it, I kind of look at it and I was like it was really sad but it kind of felt like the what we needed you know it mm -hmm. was like what I think I needed to like understand needed who to you were to have to our strong talk. relation you know to have our strong relationship now I feel like you needed that time where like I was not there right Absolutely. and like you could find your voice and your personal brand or whatever you want we call it <laughs> um and I feel like in many ways too I feel like I had to unlearn a lot of the like borderline and toxic traits of uh, being like yeah. a big sister of being like these are my sisters because I think that was a lot of my trauma was being like you know, I'm a big sister. I'm defined by that. And anything that happens to me or my sisters is on me. And it made me very controlling. And I think yeah. a big personality in that. And I think I, that was a lot of what I feel like I had to le unlearn. And it really has been only what, like, I think the last year. I mean, we could go into a whole discussion on the borderline and how that affected yeah. our relationship. Well, I want to hear about it. Yeah. Like, I think let's you, be open I about think it. you tapped in, I mean, how, <laughs> but I think we've tapped into two things is like the one thing is that I needed to individuate. And I think that that is not unique to me. That's not unique to our relationship. I think it's pretty standard for a lot of people in, you know, trauma bonded relationships or especially middle children, especially when you're close in age to an older oldest sibling 
you need time to individuate. And for me, that meant going on on, on, a, on my own and yeah. taking a big leap of faith and taking a fucking gap year um, after high school. And just like, I, you know, not going to the same college or I refuse to apply to Harvard. Like yeah. I refuse to apply to Harvard because I was like my whole life, I took the same classes as you. I did everything I could, you know, and it was exhausting. You know, it's it, trying to be Nadia Okamoto is exhausting. Trying to be a man Marie is really fun. <laughs> you know, like, um, yeah. it's exhausting. So there's the individuation thing that, you know, needs to happen for any kid, but I think especially middle children. But and then there's the borderline thing, which, you know, put a really big, bo- you know, border between us for the longest time because, um, you know, these are things that I had a lot of anger and a lot of, honest honest hatred Mm -hmm. towards you that was mired with a lot of jealousy um and distrust and frustration and just a lot of hurt a lot a lot a lot a lot um (laughs) from being I think the target of a lot of your borderline tendencies yeah and these are things that I was so frustrated angry and upset about until you got that diagnosis and until I, you know, went out on my own and started just buying audible books about BPD. Yeah. And during that, the, it was kind of the year fallout. Um, me and you didn't, t- I think Nadia, you graduated in 2016. Of high school, yeah. We barely talked in high school, even though I took all the same classes as you. Um, y- yeah. And, oh my God, so much. I, I could go on so many tangent right, tangents right now from that. And then after you graduated, we did not talk. 2017, 2018, I graduated in 2018. We kind of talked in 2019 and then 2020. I honestly think it was like seven years because- It was a um, long time. And you know, I I, I actually, like I really, I think it's, I'm really proud of us for sitting here and having this conversation because I think that even for me, knowing I have borderline, I have so much guilt about like the hurt I caused other people and it makes me angry at myself, but then I kind of, then channel that anger back out, you know, and I think it makes me kind of a mean person. And I think, you know, borderline personality disorder is something I was diagnosed with, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, basically. Mm -hmm. So, which kind of marks coincides with when you and I started talking again. Yeah. And I think that borderline has this reputation of being the diagnosis where you can't hold relationships healthily with the people around you. And it makes you like a toxic kind of rough person to be around and a really hard person to have stable relationships with. And I think that for me, like when I got diagnosed, the narrative was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, this is awful. But I think in many ways and actually really highlighted by our relationship, having that diagnosis was everything because it kind of put into perspective, like why am I the way that I am? But it also gave us both vocabulary to be like, okay, that self-hatred that I have, right, is very much something that consumed me. And I think you were also going through so much on your own. Um, And, you know, we don't have to go too deep into this too, but I feel like, you know, for us, it was very much the, for, you know, the first decade of our relationship after you were born, right? And, you know, toddler to age 13, um, we were super close, right? But it was very much a relationship of like, I am your big sister, right? Mm -hmm. And I am to protect you. And I am supposed to set an (laughs) example for you, right? And whether or not I did protect you well was like, I think we had a common enemy of like the the chaos in the house or the chaos around us. Or protecting Issa. Protecting Issa, protecting our little sister and protecting mom. Yeah. But I think that what really kind of broke us was when I started experiencing more trauma with dad and with dating, my first like relationships with scary men, um, and then you were partially hospitalized. This is, that's, okay, yeah, before you go there, it's interesting though, it's somebody during the whole, I'm gonna use the word, li- like this word lightly, but the fallout of your diagnosis was a lot of clarity for me. And I think that was more clarity for you, obviously having an explanation for why you are the way you are, but I also mirrored a lot of your confusion, right? If I showed you love and I didn't get it in return, or if I showed you attention, I didn't get it in return. If I went out of my way to like try to bond with you and you know, the ADHD thing too yeah. was huge. Um, I had a therapist tell me like trauma and BPD and all these things, they can be explanations. That doesn't mean that they're an excuse, right? Your trauma Mm -hmm. is never an excuse, but it can be a major explanation. But for me, that explanation led to also me getting to a point where I'm open 
to forgiveness. Yeah. And I'm open to forgiving you for a lot of, you know, the things that happened between us or the silence that also occurred that was extremely confusing for me. Um, and I feel like was one of the most harmful things. Probably, yeah, definitely the most harmful. And, you know, even the situation with our biological father, right? I felt very alone in a lot of what we went through for a really long time. And um, I didn't have any, anyone to talk to. And there were many years where, you know, I think you went and dove into your own relationships and then it was just me and Isa kind of figuring yeah. it out. And that also was really confusing um, for me. And I definitely had a lot of anger that I never processed and I never got to talk to you about because yeah. you never felt open to talking about it. And after... Well, yeah, I think I had that like adolescent period of anything that was mentioned about yeah. trauma. I was but like, we're where, not talking about that's this. That's where BPD comes in is yeah. listening to books about it and realizing that, you know, untreated, undiagnosed, unmedicated BPD, the way that it, I mean, you can talk about this more, yeah. but the way that it expresses is a lot of, you know, diving into other relationships and prioritizing romantic relationships over any other relationships. Yeah. Um, and getting carried away with things uh, when you're not aware of your tendencies. Yeah, it's a very obsessive diagnosis. I also think that it's a very black and white diagnosis, right? Which is, again, to me, I don't bring it up as an excuse, but I do think it helps explain a lot of, to be conscious of, right? Like I think that for me and you, because you were such a close relationship of mine, it was very black and white. It was like, we were either best friends all the time yeah. or it was like, we're not talking, right? And yeah. I think that- But that's also a dynamic constructed by our family. Yeah, we have that in our family. There's a lot of being disowned in our family. Yeah. Um, or you're 100% or you're not 100%. Yeah. And I think for, for me, because we went through so many periods of, you know, being the only person who I trust and the only person yeah. I had through so much shit, um, to also being the person that I couldn't even look at for years, you know, it was flipping, flip flopping between those yeah. two. And we're still working through it. Yeah, like, it's really weird yeah. to be able to text you on a 2 p.m. and on a Thursday and get a response and be like, oh, like I have a sister. I yeah. forgot, you know? Well, and I think that also, like, I think to what you're, I think it was a very much a two way street too, where I was like, you obviously had so much of that hurt. And I think also, like, the big sister dynamic of I graduated and fucking left. Yeah. I did not look back for dipped a while. The fuck out. I dipped. I was like, my mom and I were not getting along. And I was like, yeah. I am fucking leaving and I'm not coming back. And I think the things you, you and Issa were the people that I left behind. Yeah. Which is really sad. And I think that. It was um, also, a, I think the year that you left was. Chaos. Chaos and traumatic for not only our family and a lot of our mental health my mental health but also the world right like that's like trump election trump election yeah well and also to put things in perspective it was like one year where yeah trump was elected but in our own family like we, everything our dad like hit the child protective services week. yeah week. yeah child protective services stepped in amaya was partially hospitalized for an eating disorder yep. i was you know about to be pulled out of school for ptsd and then you got into harvard early i got into harvard all early <laughs> Like all within a week yeah. and it was crazy. And yeah, I mean, I feel like, okay. So one thing I really wanted to kind of talk about with you too, is this like individual, like finding your individual voice and also learning not to compete. Because I think that's something that I think about a lot in the context of even like the feminist movement, but also even as a case study, our family is this idea of like women supporting women yeah. and celebrating each other's successes. And I think that while our family is still working on this and like we're really good at supporting each other and being like you go do you you yeah. go do this i do think that there was this weird competitive dynamic that both of our parents unintentionally fostered which is like we can each only be one thing and we each own something that others yeah. cannot own right and Whether that was a label identity favorite color like yeah. we you're, or you're we orange, used to get into yeah. these huge fights where i was like my favorite color is purple and a man was like mine is orange and there Isa are moments now when you i are a polar bear i'm a penguin isa is a rabbit or a cow yeah you know like there were weird things where we could each only be one thing and there was you are beautiful you are sexy yeah. you're smart you're yeah you're smart yeah i I was hot and beautiful. I was be I was, no, I was hot and gorgeous. I was beautiful. You were beautiful and yeah. cute and smart, which is why yeah. I overcompensated on being trying to be as nerdy as possible. Mm -hmm. And Issa was like funny, you know. Yeah. 
And I think that, you know, I remember having like an absolute breakdown once when I was playing. We're all very still attached to these labels. We are very (laughs) attached to it. Like I was playing piano and I really wanted to play guitar, but then I was told I couldn't play guitar because you were playing guitar. Yeah. And I had this whole breakdown. Well, yeah, and there's these labels, but I think also yeah. even now, like Nadia's the neurotic entrepreneur, Amea's yeah. the artist, and Issa's the singer. Like these are things that I think my our mom lovingly but unintentionally kind of puts us into buckets of. But as young kids, I think it really fostered this kind of competition, right? Which is you can succeed in something, but you can't succeed in the thing that I'm succeeding in. And I think that that's something to be honest that I really felt like was an unhealthy dynamic that led to a lot of yeah. tension and I think it's also something that I've been thinking about in the context of like larger circles of women and feminist movements because I see that a lot with other female friends mm-hmm. right which is like you can go do you but only if you're succeeding in things that I don't really give a shit about yeah. but like I'm going to be the top of my game in my game and that's honestly one of the hardest things that I've had to work through in order to get to a healthier dynamic of working with women I'm thinking maybe I am still working through it now because I think it's still a double-edged sword where those were 100% harmful labels but what that translated to is I think something that a lot of Asian or immigrant you know kids go through is like okay you can go do this that I don't want you to do but if you do it you have to do it really freaking well um and that pushed us to do really really well in a lot of you know the one thing that we were pushing towards if that makes sense no it does I mean double-edged sword because as much as I look back and my mostly white (laughs) ex-boyfriends are like this is your family's toxic (laughs) like all my boyfriends are like your your family's wild like (laughs) but (laughs) you are all abused (laughs) like it's like yeah but but look at where we got and and it's hard to be mad at my mom and when therapists have suggested to me that you know I need to go work through my childhood trauma of being pigeonholed and um, being forced to perform really well I'm like okay but let's step back and remember where we were at the times of where my mom our mom was like you have to go do this really well and you have to go win these competitions or whatnot it's like well that's because she was had a lot of fear which again very immigrant fear right about making money or how do you build a name for yourself when you are one of the handful of POCs at your majority white school in the widest major city in America right like how do you make a name for yourself if you're not going all the way it's it's no I I I I totally agree but I I think I'm not saying it's not valid I'm saying I think it was the pressure to not just succeed but to exceed and be exceptional was so so intense and yeah. it made like, us I, I wish it was presented as an option and not not like and a, not a necessity but it wasn't even like a necessity. if you like it you could go all the way or you can dabble with a bunch of different things like no it was very much was, yeah I think to encapsulate it really was like I think going growing up with um the environment that we grew up in it was very much like um if you're gonna be passionate about something and you're gonna that's what you're gonna do at age 16, you have to tell me your strategic plan of where you're going to end up to be number one in that yeah, area. I wish that Issa was here to talk about this, actually, because she has, me and her were talking about this yeah. a little bit ago, and um, I was, you know, being like, I hate the way we grew up. Like, why yeah. didn't we have freedom? Ah, so much expectation. And Issa was like, Amea, we're Asian. <laughs> and I was like, so? And she was like, you know, a man, like, let's, <laughs> my little sister lecturing me about the model minority myth, right? Yeah. Like, when you are Asian and you have these high expectations of performance pressed on you, and it's like math. Like, I knew I wasn't, like, great at math, but I worked my ass off to, like, get to the highest math level, even though I didn't give a shit, because if I didn't perform at that high level, which is already the expectation, then I was a disappointment. Right. Yeah, you have like to, anything below. You have anything below exceptional because you're already put at that expectation is like expected and boring. So you have to perform even higher, right? Well, like yeah, but that, if you're good at piano, we yeah. already expected you to be good at piano. So like you better win that freaking concert. But I think that that's where the anxiety comes from, which is like, yeah, and I think similarly, like my best friends who are, you know, my best friends from high school who are white because we went to a white high school, (laughs) a lot of their reaction is like, why can't you just chill? And like, why can't you just recognize that what you've done is enough? And my thing is like, 
that's just not the way I was raised to think. I was raised to think, I'm here, but I don't care where I'm now because what I'm really striving for is this 10X, you know? And I think it's like, that's honestly a behavior that I've had to really unlearn because I think it's it's really unhealthy in the way that you end up living this life where you're constantly disappointed in yourself and you're constantly yeah. like, why am I not where I could have been, you know? And I yeah. think that's something that I really had to dismantle. And I honestly think that that's something that's really helped my um how I am as a big sister right because I think that there was a period of time where it wasn't just mom being the tiger mom it was me and I was very much a tiger mom around grades with you and Issa um or else yeah and I was and a lot of that (laughs) was like me or else mom was very much like I think she was like I'm not gonna be a tiger mom that about that I'm gonna be a tiger mom about art and so Nadia stepped in and was like let's do math homework you know Mm -hmm. at least with Issa more so and I I don't remember that yeah and I think that for me like (laughs) that kind of obsession with exceptionalism is something that I really had to unlearn. And I I, I agree that in many ways it's cultural, but I also think that it's something that like, I was so unhappy until I think I really started thinking through, I can just be in the present moment and be okay. And it's not going to forfeit my ambition. You know, I'm just, it can just, I can just be, and like we can be friends and it doesn't have to be about our career in the moment. We can be friends. And I think that's something I really had to think through. It's interesting, like, when you're talking about, oh, I have to do this, I have to succeed at this, it's like, like, well, why? Like, according to who? Like, are you, because I feel like whenever I am worried I'm not measuring up to something, I'm comparing to the people around me, and I'm also worried about upsetting our mother. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can let go of those two things, then you're, like, chilling. Yeah. But the the coded the coded motivations there are being better than your peers and being terrified of our mother. <laughs> yeah, which in, I think in many ways is like, is a cultural thing. Like I think it's something a lot of other Asian American people can um, relate to is that growing up with pretty intense discipline and expectations. Even when they tell you they're not tiger mothers. Yeah, our mom swears that she's not a tiger mom. Like but swears. She, she, swears she swears she's not a tiger mom, yeah. but it's because she is not a stereotypical tiger mom in the way that her mom was. Enjoy. But she's a tiger mom in the you sense. Better win this competition, man. She is not. She's not a tiger mom when it comes to grades, like straight A's. Yeah. She is kind of. She's more of a tiger mom around like career, like intact, like who yeah. you are. I think right? it was more intense when we were. Let's like we'll roll it back. I think it was. It was more intense when she knew that we were like the ones that was, were going to like pull ourselves out of our situation. Yeah, um, and I think in many ways, yeah. like I used to. Like a she lot couldn't of my, support us financially, and what she, so what she could do was like force us to go financially support ourselves, which I think is more important for you and me when we were younger. Yeah. Um, because she wasn't making money. No, at that so time. like I started babysitting when I was like twelve, thirteen. I, I we had an allowance for like half a year at one point or some shit, and then otherwise like. Like, I have genuine confusion every time. It was half allowance, and then we had to give it back. Genuine. Ge- <laughs> so we, did, we would get an allowance, and then at the end of the month, it'd be like, um, so you know that allowance. I need, I need to go buy groceries. <laughs> I, I need to go get groceries now. <laughs> I, I have genuine confusion when Issa is like, goes shopping with mom. Yeah. Or, or like, literally, I mean, not to like work out. I'm going to get in so much trouble for bringing this up on the podcast. Because I, I do get a little spoiled sometimes, but it's like, you go shopping, and then mom will like buy Issa's shirt and then you're like holding a shirt you want and you're like hey, hey let me pull out my credit card yeah. <laughs> like, I'll go I think for, context, on my own. <laughs> for context our mom is like doing well now so well She's so well so well but yeah. when a man and I were in high school that was not the case like no. you know and we were talking a lot about this on social media we were making all this content around like we have Christmas presents and yeah. mom got us like kind of some, <laughs> we something Christmas we really wanted presents. And like, that's a huge step because I think for a lot of our Christmases, it was like mom went to the dollar store and got us a ruler and some mechanical pencils, not usually lead for the mechanical yeah. pencils because those are too expensive. Oh my God, a Kumon book. Yeah, Kumon, like uh, workbooks, edu- because they were an educational investment. Yeah. Um, and you got like a science kit if it was a really special year yeah but those were so cool like I yeah. was those you know where you like make the little jelly crystals. and every time you touch it mom would be like that's a really big treat that's a really <laughs> or, she, or she'd be like so you're gonna go into med you're gonna become a scientist become a medi- medi- <laughs> medicine yeah person i mean i think there's so much that we could talk about now but i think that like 
I wanted to just have like a little check in and I think that I also want to say I'm really proud of you and I think you've become such an incredible like light in my life and also so many other people's lives and I think again like I mourn a lot of the time that we lost but I also yeah, think that absolutely. it was necessary time because you've blossomed into this incredible artist yeah. and woman and friend and while I may not be your best friend I am you, you are, are my you, best you're friend my best friend don't worry <laughs> no way you're my best friend um, no way. but uh but yeah I love you very much and I'm very proud of you thank you and for all of y'all no equally back at rape right back at you <laughs> right back at for you. everyone listening um you're listening to another episode of tigress we are back every single wednesday uh usually recording at the dcp studios in new york city huge thank you to my team and my sisters are actually visiting for the next couple weeks so you might hear quite a bit more from them bye y'all